Hi. In the Rise of Adventism, edited by Edwin Scott Gausted, this new chapter, chapter 9, is Millerism, and the author is David T. Arthur. William Miller did not intend, as he and his followers frequently stated, to distract and divide the churches of America with the message of Christ's second advent about 1843. Nor did he have any desire to form a new ecclesiastical organization to compete with existing churches. Millerites had come from nearly all Protestant groups, most especially Baptist, Congregational, Christian, Methodist, and Presbyterian churches. They viewed themselves as unsectarian, a term which was only vaguely understood, but by which they tried to say that they had laid aside the the peculiar man-made beliefs and practices which divided Christians and would focus instead on the plain word of God on which all should be able to agree. In 1822, as part of his statement of faith, William Miller wrote, quote, I believe that before Christ comes in his glory, all sectarian principles will be shaken and the votaries of the several sects scattered to the four winds and that none will be able to stand but those who are built on the word of God. End of quote. Later, in writing of sectarianism, he said that it was, quote, always produced by some private opinion of man, rather than by the plain declara declaration of God's word. End of quote. Miller was thus allied in spirit with those who denied the validity of what they believed were the man-made beliefs and practices which divided American Protestantism, who discarded history and tradition and went directly to the scriptures as the basis of belief and practice. A literal interpretation of the scriptures would eliminate the div divisive accretions and restore in its purity the belief and practice of the primitive, ch primitive church upon which all Christians could unite. Since the word of God plainly taught the second advent of Christ, Miller and his followers believed that all right-thinking, God-fearing Christians would soon be persuaded of its truth. In common with other anti-sectarians, Miller did not view his second advent message as in any way man-made, but rather as a statement of biblical truth. From the beginning, tension between Millerites and others was inherent because of the former's conviction that their message was of God, while the special positions of others were of man. To be sure, Miller invited others to test his conclusions, but few had the knowledge to do so, and those who did, and disagreed with him, were never able to convince him of any error. Miller and his colleagues, however, did not join those who tried to break down the existing denominations or carry on a campaign against them. Miller had considered himself a Baptist throughout his life, and in their situation, with time so short, most Millerites were content to work within the existing structure. William Miller, Joshua Himes, Josiah Litch, Henry Dana Ward and Henry Jones and the other early Millerite leaders thus worked within existing churches preaching their message. Miller's early policy was to preach in no place except where invited and this practice was followed by others. Their goal was to warn the world and prepare the churches for Christ's return. The message usually produced a quickening of interest. Converts were won and church congregations grew. Elaborate organization was unnecessary, time was short, and they would work within the existing ecclesiastical framework. Confident of their message and its truth, they were confident of its general acceptance, confident that their work would soon be done and their goal attained. But matters did not work out this way. Millerism became a disruptive and separatist, separatist movement, quite as sectarian, to use Miller's, the Millerites' term, as any other organized church. How this came about is the subject of this paper. When Joshua V. Himes joined Miller in early 1840 as the chief promoter and publicist of Miller's cause, the Adventist movement began to assume a more distinct and independent course. Himes did not wait for doors to open. He opened them. And where they remained closed, he circumvented them by cutting new ones. Lecture tours were arranged, taking Miller to places where he had never been invited. Halls were hired where churches were closed. A great tent was raised where halls could not be readily or reasonably obtained. Under Himes's leadership, Millerism became aggressive, 
Miller was no longer simply a pleasant and effective revivalist, saving sinners and building up churches. He and his movement became independent forces capable of threatening and disrupting the churches. With Himes leading the way, Millerism became increasingly self-conscious and self-confident, a major religious phenomenon with which the churches would have to reckon. On February 28, 1840, J. V. Himes issued a paper in Boston titled Signs of the Times. Miller had long wished for a publication in which he could set forth his views freely and reply to his critics. With Himes providing the initiative and securing the financial backing, Signs of the Times and its sister paper, Midnight Cry, issued by Himes in New York City, provided a forum for discussion and served as a means of communication among Adventists. Not only did ministers, theologians, and lecturers write for their columns, but also letters came in from around the country from people interested in the subject. News of prominent lecturers and their public appearances was spread before the public, as was news of national and international events and scientific and technological advances, which they used to support their belief in the nearness of the Second Advent. This medium of communication among Adventists helped to forge a bond of union. Their sense of isolation disappeared to be replaced by a sense of community. The press was the first of the important independent and separative Adventist institutions. Another was the General Conference. In August 1840, Himes announced through Signs of the Times that a General Conference was under consideration for the purpose of edifying and unifying the believers but not to create a new religious body. Unanimity of opinion on the Second Advent question was not expected, but in order to achieve harmony, anyone who expected to take an active part in the conference had first to declare his faith in the near approach of Christ and make known to the Committee of Arrangements the points he wished to discuss. In this way, the conference was restricted to believers. The conference convened in October. Elected officers and created committees. The conferees engaged in devotional exercises and listened to lectures and sermons. Most important, while denying any intention to establish a creedal statement, they set forth certain points of belief. Although not in agreement regarding the exact year of Christ's return, they agreed that it was near. Other ideas were declared false. The temporal millennium, the invisible reign of Christ, in the present world and the world's conversion. Christ would come at the beginning of the millennium to judge the world. The reign of Christ and the saints would then begin, followed by the final condemnation of the wicked at the end of the millennium and the commencement of the eternal age. On the subject of their relation to the churches, the conferees wish to disassociate themselves from the schismatics. Quote, we are not of those who sow discord among brethren, who withdraw from the fellowship of the churches, who rail at the office of the ministry and triumph in the exposure of the errors of a secular and apostate church, and who count themselves holier than others or wiser than their fellows. End of quote. They did believe that God had opened to them things in his word, which had been hidden for a long time, and they wished to offer these to all the world. But they said, we have no purpose to distract the churches with any new inventions or to get ourselves a name by starting another sect among the followers of the Lamb. They concluded, we neither condemn nor rudely assail others of a faith different from our own, nor dictate in matters of conscience for our brethren, nor seek to demolish their organizations, nor build new ones of our own, but simply to express our convictions like Christians. Conference business followed. Resolutions were passed approving the establishment of the signs of the times and recommending that all believers in the near advent of Christ subscribe to it and promote it among their acquaintances and in their churches. Two committees were appointed to aid in the promotion of the cause. A committee of correspondence was chosen for the purpose of keeping in touch with Adventists around the world and charged with the duty of calling the next general conference. A committee of publication was established for the purpose of advising and supervising the publishing work. I'll put in a link to a 
some recommended books on prophecy because the, the solution here is solution, well, the evident sincerity that the author here, David Arthur, Arthur uh, communicates. The sincerity of all these believers is, un, is undoubted. Nevertheless, they weren't well taught when it comes to prophecy. So the solution obviously is is to get books that are reliable and dependable when it comes to the correct interpretation of prophecy. So we'll put in a, a link to a video we did on recommended books. These are not the only recommended books, but there's a selection of recommended books that have served the test of time on how to interpret Bible prophecy soundly and properly.